I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. The man's name is Al Libby. Abu Anas Al Libby. He's 49, 50 years old, a middle-aged man with sons living till recently in Tripoli. In fact, I was told that he'd applied for a job in the oil ministry. And then suddenly, after morning prayers, he was taken, abducted, snatched, kidnapped, rendered. Rendition took him to a naval ship that we're told by the Obama administration was put there specially for him. The suggestion was there was interrogation or challenge going on on the ship. But now the report from CBS News, others confirming that Al Libby has arrived in New York. The reason New York is, unlike Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and others, uh, Libby was indicted by, in New York by the prosecutors before the attack on New York and Washington. This dates back to the East Africa embassy bombings. Tom, um, the question of bringing Al Libby to New York, this raises the fact that Al Qaeda is now routinely, and so are the jihadists, throwing out threats. The capability of Al Qaeda in 2013, how do you measure it compared to 12 years ago? Well, I, I think their global footprint, it's indisputable, has greatly expanded through their, uh, you know, waging war through various insurgencies. You know, one of the things I, I like to point out is that the START database, this is maintained by the Homeland Security Department, which has a definition of al-Qaeda, notes that prior to 9-11, prior to those spectacular terrorist attacks, the 15 out of every 16 al-Qaeda recruits was trained to fight in insurgencies or fight in wars abroad, not selected to take part in major spectacular terrorist operations. Only one out of every 16 was selected to take part in those types of operations. Today, um, that ratio is clearly much greater than that. So what they've done is what they're always about, what they're always trying to do, is they're always trying to acquire political power for themselves in the greater Middle East, South Asia, and North Africa. And and when you look at it, when you define them correctly, you define them as political revolutionaries who use terrorism as a tactic. You understand that their their game, where they are in the game, is actually much. They've actually advanced the ball quite a bit, uh, unfortunately. Now, what we talk about here in the U.S. is we are obsessed and, and understandably so with the their ability to strike us here on U.S. soil. But what I like to point out is that that's always been a difficult thing to do. Even before 9/11, as Al Qaeda was plotting terrorist attacks inside the U.S., they ran into great difficulties with the 9-11 operation with other planned attacks. It's always been, that's before the Department of Homeland Security was established, it's before these massive bureaucratic walls were put up, before all these, you know, sort of impediments were put in place. So, you know, they have not been able to launch a mass casualty attack against us. That's both because of our vigilance, but also because of luck. We got lucky on a couple occasions. But the bottom line is that the threat level from al-Qaeda has not receded. It's actually greatly expanded when you properly define and understand that they're leading the charge in various insurgencies around the world. And that necessarily is tied, as the 9-11 Commission found, to threats against us. The momentary kidnapping, abduction, detention of the Prime Minister of Libya, do we believe that was connected to the al Libby rendition? Do they? We think they grabbed him to make sure that he didn't cooperate. That the reporting, the reporting uh, suggests that that's what. That's why he was held. Was that, that the prime minister was held as sort of a way to flex the muscle of the jihadists to show that they're objecting to Abu Anas uh, you know, detention there in Libya, and then you know, brought to a U.S. naval ship. Um, that's what I've seen based on a bunch of different reporting. Now, what the true circumstances are, I'm not really sure, but it makes sense to me that that's what it was. Basically, this was this was saying, hey, you didn't stand up and stop this guy Abu Anas al Libya from being, um, you know, brought into custody there on Libyan soil, and we're going to flex our muscles a little bit and show you how we object to that. Now, here he is in New York. Uh, Mr. Raggio, how do you measure the transnational threat of al-Qaeda here, 2013, all these years? NYPD is a really hard target, but this is a very big temptation to Ansar al-Sharia, for example. That was one of the groups that made threats last week after al Libby was snatched. Well, uh, as Tom said, it, it's always been difficult to conduct t- attacks here on the U.S., but what al-Qaeda does is, uh, or has always done is um, it attempts to build its a worldwide network um, with two aims: one to establish the to establish caliphates in the various countries, with the goal of establishing a global caliphate, and then as well as conducting attacks against the U.S. and the West. And while it's fighting those local insurgencies against the um, Arab or Muslim gover- governments, it's pulling fighters from all of these areas, and it takes a select group of them and trains them to conduct attacks overseas. Prior to 9/11. There was limited battlefields. You had Afghanistan, you had uh, Algeria, you had um, in in the Balkans, you had in in Chechnya. 
Um, it wasn't. Now you have battlefields in Iraq, you have Syria, you have in throughout the Maghreb and in, in Western Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, so Al Qaeda, while it's still it's having difficulty executing attack here on U.S. soil, it's expanded that pool of fighters that and and as well as has a, a, a greater base of training camps where it can actually get people to carry out attacks here as well. But we can't just focus on the threat here in the United States. Right. What happens overseas ultimately will turn around and bite us here in the United States. Uh, Tom, one detail. There's a report on your site from one of your colleagues, Lisa Lenquist, about the in- the pursuit of a Norwegian national, Somali refugee, who is uh, theoretically involved in the attack in Kenya. I think nothing could say the scale of al-Qaeda better than Norway, Somalia, and Kenya, and now being pursued by the European Union. That's how big they are. I think that that's probably right. I mean, actually, when you look at the raid in Somalia that occurred on the same day that Abu Anas al-Libi, now Abu Anas al-Libi, as we've detailed along our journal, has numerous ties. Not only now he was serving the quote unquote Al Qaeda core all the way back to the early 1990s, but there are good reasons, credible reporting, to believe that he was serving the Al Qaeda core's interests in Libya at the time he was captured. He was basically setting up operations, doing all sorts of things to build up their network inside Libya. Well, when you look at the raid on the same day in Somalia, and you look at the guy who they were targeting there, a guy known as a crema to the Kenyan intelligence services. You know, lo and behold, he's the same thing. There's good reporting from the Kenyan intelligence services and others that shows that Akrima, in fact, um, had been plotting terrorist attacks on behalf of the Al Qaeda Corps in Pakistan in 2011 and 2012. And there's good reason to believe he was doing the same thing when he was targeted by U.S. Special Forces once again. Um, and in fact, when you look at the people around him and you look at the people who he's been tied to, they scream Al Qaeda. All of them have, you know, hardcore, long-standing Al Qaeda ties to the senior most levels of Al Qaeda. So, you know. This whole idea that the Al Qaeda core is one thing. Tom, we'll stop there. Tom Jocelyn, Bill Rogio, the Black Flags. I'm John Batchelor.